Welcome back to the HBO official Band of Brothers podcast. This is Roger Bennett. You say flash, I say thunder. Episode 7, The Breaking Point. One hour, nine minutes of combat, death and trauma, which is basically a mini-movie in its own right, set in that frozen hellscape that was the Ardennes Forest during the Battle of the Bulge, January 1945, where Easy Company are surrounded both by Germans and physical and psychological horrors to which no man was immune. The episode is told from the vantage point of First Sergeant Carlwood Lipton, played by Donnie Wahlberg, a West Virginian from a hard scrabble background who dedicated his entire being to maintaining the men's morale, both covering for the inept company XO Norman Dyke and filling the enormous vacuum his lack of leadership creates. An incompetence best captured by that poet warrior, Bill Garnier. Jesus Christ. You gotta do all this with a CEO who's got his head so far up his fucking ass that lump in his throat is his goddamn nose. The scenes unfold in graphic detail, with almost no respite. Muck and Pankala are eviscerated by a shell, Hubler mistakenly shooting and killing himself with a Luger, and both Joe Toy and Garnier having their legs blown off. An anguish-inducing sight that's an agony for the men, portrayed by the heavy symbolism of Buck Compton's dropped helmet in the snow. Buck was a great combat leader. He was wounded in Normandy, and again in Holland. He received the Silver Star for his part in taking out those German guns on D-Day. He took everything the crowds could throw at him time and again. I guess he just couldn't take seeing his friends touring Garnier all torn up like that. No one ever thought any less of him for it. The episode's climax is the attack on Foy itself, a set piece which sees the unraveling of Dyke at some cost. Sir, we are sitting ducks here. We have to keep moving! Amidst the myriad of gut punches, chaos and horror, the breaking point continues to explore Band of Brothers' core themes. The arbitrariness of death, which continues to hang over the company at all times. The psychological trauma of war. And what it means to be a true leader which Lieutenant Spears explains to Sergeant Lipton is something he doesn't have to look for to find out. I've been told there's always been one man they could count on. Let him into the Bois Jacques, held him together when they had the crap shell at him in the woods. Every day kept the spirits up, kept the men focused, gave them direction. All the things a good combat leader does. You don't have any idea who I'm talking about, do you? No, sir. Hell, it was you for a sergeant. Ever since Winter's made battalion, you've been the leader of Easy Company. My guest today is that consistent, nurturing, low-key, ever-dependable member of Easy Company who emerges as a strong, empathetic leader during the Battle of the Bulge. The character... Sergeant Lipton is played by a gent who emerged from Dorchester, Massachusetts as a pop star before unleashing dramatic skills that proved you can say more with a single look than most actors can do with a three-page soliloquy. It's a joy to welcome a man for whom every day is abs day. It's Mr. Donnie Wahlberg. <laughs> That's... <laughs> heap it all on Lipton. You don't have to heap any on me. But uh, I'll take the abs day. <laughs> Thanks, Raj. Oh, Donnie, it is great to have you. I do want to touch upon your career. Obviously, Donnie, you broke through with the boy band New Kids on the Block in 1988. But after New Kids broke up in 1994, you moved into movies and television. And you've said of that time, 
I always had a belief there was something better out there for me. And you found the role in The Sixth Sense, Vincent Gray, and then your agent got a call about Tom Hanks doing a Second World War show. They then sent you the script, which you read, loved. Blown away. Although you said you instantly leaned to Lipton. Absolutely. They wanted you originally to play Spears. Well, I don't know if they wanted me to play Spears, but they definitely asked me to audition for Spears. I went in alone in a room with Tom Hanks. We're in Tom Hanks' office, the audition. Tom Hanks' office, and I'm auditioning for Spears, and I'm literally playing the sequence in Foy where he runs across the German lines. And, you know, I'm trying to play this in an audition for Tom Hanks. I was running around his office and jumped behind a chair a big leather recliner, if I recall, peeking out around the corner, delivering my dialogue. <laughs> I mean, nothing says I am committing to this part more than you leaping across one of Hank's club seats. But Hank saw something different. I don't know what it was. I don't know if you know what it was, but then he had you read for Carl with Lipton. When we're honest with ourselves, we can really identify whether we were our best or not. And I think I did a good audition as Spears, but I don't know that I was 1 million percent committed. Even though I jumped behind that recliner, I don't know that I was a thousand percent committed to getting behind that recliner. And someone with the acting ability and directing ability of Tom Hanks is going to pick up on that. They're just going to sense it. And he may have sensed something about me in our conversation before the audition and then coupled with the audition i didn't feel like i got the part of spears that day i'll just put it to you that way i didn't think i was good enough to play that part but i think he picked up on something about me that people who are at the top of their craft and field do a great ceo of a company will look at an employee and say you know what I need you to be climbing this ladder because there's something about you. There's something in you. He just identified something in me that had more of the sensibilities of Lipton in that audition. You returned for a second audition. It was a much bigger affair. There was a hundred plus guys there. In my mind, I imagine it a bit like the first day at Curahy, but for actors. And you went in to read a three-page call with Lipton scene with, I love this, Rick Schroeder. Mm -hmm. there reading for winters my god that would have been a very different show i'd prepared for days on this three-page monologue essentially of lipton i think winters who rick schroeder was reading for had about three lines back to me and i just went on this sort of tear about lieutenant dyke in the monologue so when i got there they said hey by the way they want you to read a couple of scenes as joe toy i was like oh okay this is like an Eddie Murphy production where Eddie Murphy's playing every character. You went in ready to play them all. <laughs> yeah, Raj, this, is, this gets crazy. I assume they probably really liked me for the series in some capacity. And if I fumbled Lipton, maybe they could make it work as Toy. And I actually did okay reading the Joe Toy parts. I wasn't there for that. I was there that day fully prepared and incredibly confident that I was the right guy to play Lipton. I had prepared so much for that audition. And when I walked into the room, there was a VHS handheld camera on a tripod. Tom Hanks was there and Steven Spielberg, of course. And he literally took the camera off the tripod and it was basically like my coverage in a scene. It was as if Rick Schroeder, they were shooting over him onto me. So you didn't even really see him in the shots. Now, in my mind, that told me he was already cast as Winters. I was like, okay, well, he must already have his part. So they're just focusing on me in this particular read through of the scenes. Spielberg said at one moment in this audition, he said to you, that was awesome. He also slapped the little viewfinder on the camera closed. And Hank said, eyebrow raised. I guess you nailed it, kid. And when I picture that, it's like Hank's playing Hank's and I love it. But Donnie, you've worked with De Niro with Pacino, but you've said that audition was the single greatest moment of your career. Rarely do you train, train, train and plan and have a whole concept of what you're going to do. And it actually goes completely 
the way you planned. It all comes to fruition exactly as you'd hoped. In that audition, it did. And to get that response from Spielberg and Hanks, I was very proud. You landed the Lipton role and you immediately set about preparing for it. You reach out to the real life Carwood Lipton, who along with Dick Winters had been one of the chief sources for Stephen Ambrose as he wrote Band of Brothers. Can you tell us about your first encounter with the man? Because you've said it was very intimidating. Not only had I read the book, I'd also watched a compilation of the interviews of the men as well. So we'd seen who they are, heard the stories of them and held them in very high regard. Playing a real life person is intimidating because you hope they approve of you. It's almost like you're reverted back to high school age. You hope you're cool enough to hang with this particular group of friends or this particular person will say yes when you ask them on a date, right? So for me, it was like, okay, now Tom <laughs> Hanks and Steven Spielberg gave me the job, but this is the real guy. What if he doesn't like me? What if it doesn't click when he's this hero from World War II and he thinks I'm some schmo, you know, like <laughs> that's not going to be good. But fortunately we hit it off. He kept saying, everyone says my grandson looks like you, that he's a young Donnie Wahlberg. And I was like, man, I didn't even know he would know who I am. He was a remarkable man, Corwin Lipton, humble origins, tough Huntington, West Virginia roots. And he actually tells his early life story in this episode in a foxhole waiting for the enemy to attack i read an article about paratroopers in life magazine talked about the training how hard it was said if you want to make it as a paratrooper you had to be the best i wanted to fight with the best sir a recipient of two bronze stars three purple hearts post-war he went on to become a successful entrepreneur in glass and plastics he was actually the man carwood who suggested Ambrose use Band of Brothers from Shakespeare's Henry V. You got to know the man. I mean, he sounds incredible all round, like an intellect, an entrepreneur, a war hero, a family man. What was he like in real life? The first word that comes to mind is grace. He is an incredibly gracious human being, a real gentleman. But beneath his humility, there was a really driven man. Reading him on paper, he sounded very humble, very unassuming. But when I got to know him personally, I definitely discovered very competitive. We learn in World War II, the soldiers didn't hate each other. They understood that they each had to do what they had to do. And there's sort of a mutual respect. Lipton had that same respect, but he also was very competitive. He said to me one day, I know those soldiers were well-trained and so was I. And I wanted to prove that I was the best and I wanted to serve with the best. Everything about him wanted to be top notch. And I got to know him in those early conversations and told him I'll reach out as we get closer to go to England to start shooting. And when I got there, I was alone basically for what, 11 months in my flat. Kirk Acevedo was living upstairs for me and Michael Cudlitz was living downstairs. We had a three stacked apartment. So I had those guys and got incredibly close with them. But a lot of times when it came to the actual work, I just turned to Carwood. That's who I spoke to. Sometimes I would call about a specific scene and ask his opinion or his advice. Sometimes I would call and we would just talk. I remember one time I called and his wife answered the phone and she'd say, oh, hold on, Donnie. Let me get him. He's working on the house right now. He was always active and he was 80 years old at the time. And you know, I'm holding and I'm holding and I'm holding. And he'd come down and he'd go, hello, Donnie. And I said, how are you, sir? He said, oh, swell. I just climbed down from the roof. I was like, what are you doing on your roof? He's like, we needed some repairs. So I just climbed up there and started doing them. And I remember him telling me, I said, man, what was it like in Bastogne? Like, how much sleep did you get? He said, well, we didn't sleep much, maybe a couple hours here and there. He said, but I still only sleep three hours a night. And I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, I only sleep three hours a night. I said, well, is that because you're trained from the war that you just learned to do that, to get by on no sleep? He said, no. He said, I just love life so much. I don't want to sleep through it. I don't want to miss out on anything. This is an 80 year old man telling me he only wants to sleep three hours a night because A, it's all he needs, but more importantly, because he loves life so much, he wants to enjoy it all. I mean, it's amazing. 
and he described the essence of the band of brothers. He said, none of us could even think of the fact we would be killed. If we were afraid of anything, it was that we wouldn't measure up. We wanted to be heroes, not to the American public or in books, yeah. but to each other. You would call him every day before every scene so that you could really try and get the performance of Lipton as close to the real man. I would oftentimes call him and talk about what the scene was and see if he had a recollection of something similar. And he would oftentimes say yes, occasionally say no. The scene following Muck and Pinkala getting hit by the mortar. It was originally written that Lipton was hammering a cross into the ground. And I called Lipton about it and he said, you know, that just would never happen. That just wouldn't happen. He said, there aren't a lot of things that bother us about movies, but those things bother us. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, because you're in combat, you're too worried about an attack or a counterattack. There's no time to have a memorial in the middle of the woods for your friend. He said, now that's part of the tragedy of war as well, is because when your friends get killed, your first instinct is relief that it wasn't you. And then you have to live with the guilt and shame of that when you have time to relax. He said, but what you can't do is sit there putting crosses in the ground and everyone's standing around. He says, it's just not realistic. The Germans are just 50, 100 yards away shooting mortars at us. There's no time for that. I told the director at the time, David Frankel, and I love David Frankel, so there's no slight on him. And I said, listen, we're not doing that. We're not doing that moment of silence. We're not doing it. And he was like, what do you mean we're not doing it? And I'm sure he had responsibilities and had things planned out that he wanted to shoot. And I said, we're not doing it. What do you mean we don't get dramatic closure? Yeah. I said, you know, I understand for you guys here shooting, it's hard to keep getting notes from the veterans through the actors, but this one, I'm not budging on it because he wouldn't budge on it. He told me this is the only time he's ever said, no, no, don't do that. This story plays right into what makes this series so great. Hanks and Spielberg's simple directive to honor the men's memory, their truth, rather than serve the script. And you, you took that so seriously, you really, took on Lipton's being on set, you really worked out how to be the sergeant of the cast to lead. You tried to play that role, the Lipton role, amongst the actors, right? It's not that I tried to play it. I think, again, kudos to Tom Hanks for finding something in me that resonated as what we thought of Carwood Lipton. So when boot camp started, we had real life military guys who were training us under Dale Dye. So our guy was Sergeant E, Sergeant Edmondson, and he was a ranger in real life. He, to me, was the epitome of Lipton. If I could find a modern day version of who I could model Lipton after, it'd be him. And I watched Sergeant E during boot camp. That was like my real life reference. I would watch him and say, he is doing the things that you would imagine Lipton doing. He was that guy, quiet, humble, but alert, always paying attention. You could tell he was ultra competitive. The different actors were in different platoons and we were first platoon and he wanted our platoon to be the best. I remember at the end of the first day, he said, all right, step up front. You're gonna lead the platoon and march us here and then march us there. And then we're gonna do this. And I was like, well, I'm gonna do it. He was like, yep, go ahead. I said, I don't know what to do. He said, you'll figure it out, just go. God. And from the first day of boot camp, I was basically, that and I did find myself at times not trying to emulate what I thought Lipton would be like, but just doing what I thought was the right thing to do. You know, David Schwimmer was in boot camp with us at first playing Sobel, and I didn't act like his enemy because the guys didn't like Captain Sobel. I actually was helpful to David. He'd hurt his leg a little bit, and I was like, Hey, man, guys are all fighting over the bath. Why don't you go first? Why don't you go and take care of yourself first and get all sorted out and I'll get the guys organized for who can go and do what when. And I don't know why I did that. Maybe I was inspired by Lipton, but I think it's also just kind of what I do. Even in my band, I don't call myself the leader of the new kids on the block, but I'm certainly, I, I guess I am the leader of new kids on the block. <laughs> I do all those things that I would think a good first sergeant would do. 
I'm sure the spears of the new kids on the block says, Donny, I guess you were the leader of new kids on the block all the time. It's an incredible thing to read about the series. The shooting experience, you've said it was like we were in the army, we were not at war, but we were in the army. I mean, you would march down to the set three miles from your tent, sit in the rain, sleep, all weathers, waiting in the woods. Craft services were not a thing. Dale Dye and those guys, they went full on. And there was a moment in boot camp where guys started getting injured and Dale Dye was told from the production that you got to go easier on the guys and slow down. And he challenged us one morning for anyone who was hurt to step out of line. And he said, if you have a cold, <laughs> a cracked fingernail, if your feelings are hurt, get out of the formation and step forward. There's no trouble, just do it. And he set this all up and I'm in the front of my platoon and I'm grumbling under my breath. Nobody step out of line, nobody step out from behind me, nobody, and, you know? And I was trying to like send telepathy to everyone. We didn't want to quit. I didn't want my platoon to quit. I didn't want anyone to step out of the formation. And from that moment on, we just took the challenge. Also what happened is Dale Dye was like, these guys are all in. So we're not going to use trailers for the actors. If we're shooting in the woods for 16 hours, they're going to sit in mud puddles for 16 hours. And that's what we were doing. And that was a little extreme as well. So I think at some point, much like the non-commissioned officers went to Colonel Sink to tell him about Captain Sobel not being up to the task, myself and Frank John Hughes and Michael Cudlitz, we sort of became the de facto leaders. We went to Dale Dye and said, you know, <laughs> this is the only time I was ever dishonest with Dale Dye. I was like, Captain Dye, we know some of the guys are going to start breaking down. <laughs> Dale Dye was understanding and cooperative. He got us access to our trailers. Now, guys didn't always go to their trailers. <laughs> guys still like to be out in the woods. When summertime came along, everybody would just sit on set and smoke cigarettes and share candy bars or rations. But when it's 20 degrees outside, guys needed to go somewhere warm. There was a point where honoring the men didn't necessarily mean catching pneumonia out in a field in England. It meant being able to do the best job you could do when the camera's on and really represent them the right way. And you've still got an injury from the pack. Oh my gosh, my lower back and my upper back. Man, that pack, woof. Yeah, you carry that with pride, though. I love that you call that your band the brothers injury. Well, I had a lot of snacks in there that I would steal <laughs> from the chow line in the morning because I knew guys were going to be hungry. I would always steal some extra rolls and some extra food. And around hour nine of sitting out in the woods in the rain, I would start handing stuff out to guys. Who was always guaranteed to be the hungriest? Malarkey. He's very fit, too. You wouldn't think he'd be hungry. Some guys just had their own little treats and stuff they would bring. <laughs> Everybody had their ways and we all learned from each other. Playing Lipton, you did carry that offset. They all called you Lipton during the shoot, right? Yeah, we all called each other the names. That wasn't us. That wasn't me making an actor choice. That was Dale Dye and his training methods. We were our rank and our character's name from day one. And we were never called anything else. I never heard Dale Dye. I think the first time he called me Donnie was in an email a couple of years after Band of Brothers was finished. I never heard him refer to me that way. I still call Michael Cudlitz bull. Like, I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? The only person I called by name was Kirk. Kirk Acevedo, who played Joe Toy. I never really called him Toy. Lipton is a study of leadership, Donnie. Covering for Dyke at the beginning. I'm fascinated by Lipton. At first, he tries to be sympathetic to Foxhole Norman. Tells his men... I wouldn't want to be a replacement officer coming in here. You're getting thrown in with a group of guys who've known each other for, what, two years? They've been in combat together since Normandy. You're supposed to just show up and lead them? How's a guy do that? How could anyone really hope to gain the respect of the toughest, most professional, most dedicated sons of bitches in the entire ETO? Huh? So if you ask me, a guy would have to march off to Berlin and come back with Hitler's mustache or something. <laughs> Your character has two things, incredible empathy and incredible belief in his fellow men. He has them on the outside, but on the inside, he admits he doesn't always feel so confident. But ultimately, it's his job to protect his men. The night before that scene where Lipton goes to Winters, 
to tell him that he doesn't think Lieutenant Dyke is up to par. Lieutenant Dyke is an empty uniform, Captain. He's just... He's not there, sir. Well, he's gonna be there tomorrow. Yes, sir. I understand he will be there physically. But tomorrow's gonna be the real deal. And he's gonna have to lead those men. He's gonna have to make decisions, sir, and I... I gotta tell you, sir, I think he's gonna get a lot of easy company men killed. I called Lipton, and I pointed out to him that this is the second time he risked his life to call out leadership that he didn't think was adequate. In the first episode of the series, when the non-commissioned officers decide they can't trust Captain Sobel, him and the other non-commissioned officers risk their lives because he questioned the quality of that leader. This guy will run through a wall for the men of Easy Company and for the better leaders, and he has the utmost respect for them, but when he doesn't, he's challenging it. So here we are in episode seven, and I'm gonna shoot the scene I called Lipton, and I pointed out to him that this is the second time he risked his life to call out leadership that he didn't think was adequate. And he said, I never connected those two things. And I said, but it's two times you did it. Doing it one time almost got you put in front of the firing squad in boot camp, but you did it again in combat. And he said, I just thought of them as two separate situations. I never correlated the two things. And I said, on paper, they look very similar. He said, you're right. And the conversation went a little bit deeper. I asked him, did you agree with Winters not removing Dyke? And he said, that's a very biting question. I said, then I'll retract the question and we don't have to talk about it. What is said in the book and what's said in the script is that he still respected Winter's leadership so much that he didn't question that. That shows how much respect he had for Winter's, you know, but a good leader does have to know when to follow and you have to know when to swallow your pride and fall in line. A good leader knows when someone else has a great idea and they'll adopt it and they'll take it on and they'll trust it. No one's a great leader because they know every single thing better than everyone else. A good director, for example, is a manager of great ideas. I never saw Steven Spielberg walking around saying, I'm the genius who did all this. It was like, no, you actors are doing this and the men of Easy Company are responsible for this. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. And good leaders are exceptional followers. You've got Spear's model of leadership, which was, as you say, superhuman. You have Winters, who is a follow me kind of guy. Lipton's style of leadership, very, very different. He's the one who treats the men like humans rather than just soldiers. There was an improvisation that I had come up with in the show. So it's not true to the story, but I thought the concept of it captured Carwood Lipton good. I'd noticed in all the scripts that there was a running thing that kind of disappeared. And that was that Malarkey wanted to find a Luger. So here we are at the Breaking Point episode and Hubler had found a Luger and accidentally shot himself with it. He bled out and died. At the end of that scene, I ended up with the Luger in my hand. And I went to Graham Yost, the writer of the Breaking Point episode. There's a scene where Mock and Pankala get hit by a mortar and Malarkey's devastated. And I said, you know, we never really answered whether or not he found a Luger. And I know it's historical and it may not be true, but... What if Lipton hands the Luger off to Malarkey that Hubler had? Just as a reminder, hey, it's not so much about the gun itself, but it was more symbolic in the scene to say, you have something to live for and to keep fighting for. Didn't I hear you say you wanted to uh, bring a Luger home for your kid brother? Yeah. Yeah, why don't you give him that? 
the action in this episode is harrowing. It takes place in the different foxholes. There are the shattering scenes of Garnier and Toy's wounds. Both lost a leg, a moment that destroys Buck Compton. Hold on, I'll be there. I'm going to help you. No! Lipton doesn't break down, and we know this from his narration, that he was savagely affected by all he did, all he saw, but he didn't break. And you got to know Lipton. How do you understand it? What about him enabled him to persevere? The stress and the conditions, they're really hard to imagine what it took for all those men to get through this. And not only that, for the leaders of these men to step up and continually put morale first, to put each other first. There was definitely a quiet strength about him. That love of life that he talked about when he was 80 years old, that was always there with him. It's hard to imagine somebody finding gratitude in the midst of something like the Battle of the Bulge, being grateful and feeling the gratitude, right? It's one thing to say, I'm grateful to be alive today, but it's another thing to live with that gratitude and to go make the most of that day. As something about him saying when he was 80 years old, how much he loved life. I think that's who he always was. I think he loved life. I think he loved waking up to the challenges of whatever life had in store for him, whether that was in the freezing cold, in the most dire conditions in the Battle of the Bulge, or whether it was as a successful businessman, or whether it was as an 80-year-old man in retirement, doing things around his house to maintain his garden. <laughs> you know. At the end of the episode, the hero shot, Lipton is leaving Foy, it's burning. We'd been looking down at the town of Foy for the better part of a month, knowing that's where we had to go. It was a great relief to have done it. I mean, tell us the story of how you were walking up that hill and director David Frankel suggested you take off the helmet, swagger a little bit. He's like, this is your moment, own it. I want to preface this story by saying David Frankel is my favorite director from Band of Brothers. I love David Frankel. And I'd say this with no ill intent to any of the other directors, but I really felt like I was working with a collaborator the whole time. As an actor, I felt like, wow, what a great director. He listened to the notes that I would give from Lipton. When we were shooting the scene of Lipton walking up the hill with Foy burning in the background, it was suggested that I take off my helmet. And I say me take off my helmet because that definitely would have been a Donnie choice, right? As an actor. I was like, I don't know about this. And Dale Dye was passing by and I started to ask him the question and he said, don't do it. And, uh, you know, under his breath, don't take off the helmet. Don't take off your helmet. I spoke to Lipton that night after shooting the scene. He said, you know, there was a moment where the director talked to me about taking off my helmet. He stopped me. He interrupted and said, well, why would you do that? I said, what do you mean? He said, why would you ever take your helmet off in combat? I said, well, I didn't. He said, well, you wouldn't. He said, you'd be waiting for a counterattack. There was no time to relax. Just because you took that town, you'd immediately expect them to regroup and counterattack. I just was like, whew, big sigh of relief. Play the truth. Play the truth. Yeah, because, you know, what a disappointment it would have been for me to let him down. The same way the men of Easy Company didn't want to let each other down. That's how we felt every time they said action every time the cameras rolled and it was your time to be on screen there was this sense of i didn't want to let easy company down and every guy felt that the final scene of the episode stunning set piece lipton and easy company taking a rare breather in a convent in rochamp first night they spent indoors in over a month and Lipton's with his men. We see Buck. The sisters sing heavenly, angelic voices. The mood of the men, exhausted. Smoking, reading, sleeping, staring off into space. They are covered in the muck of battle and bandaged. And Lipton names all of those who've been lost. I spent part of that night trying to come up with a roster for the company to see who we had left. We'd come into Belgium with 121 men and officers plus 24 replacements. 
That's 145 total. We're going out with 63. Garnier was badly wounded and Hubler died accidentally. Joe Toy had lost his leg. Among the dead were Heron, Mellet, Sawasco, Kenneth Webb, Harold Webb, Alex Pankala, and Skip Muck. Our month in Belgium cost us one good officer, Buck Compton, and one bad one, Norman Dyke. You hover over the scene almost like a living dead man. Your narration, Donny, is delivered like a man who's dead on his feet, flat, affectless. You sound like a man who's given his all. Where did you take the VO? How soon after the shoot? What was it like to get back into that headspace? It was a while after, but when it was time to do the narration, I remember just reading the first few lines, almost practicing and getting a mic level and I did it very flat and straightforward and Tom Hanks was listening and he said that's how I want you to do it that sounds perfect I don't want emotion I don't want acting I just want you to read it I just want you to talk just talk right in my ear and tell me the story without animation and that's what I did Donny Coward Lipton passed away December 2001 so he got to see the Band of Brothers series come out. What feedback did he give you on the finished product? Much like the man himself in the series, the confirmation and affirmation I got from him was never verbal. It was just in the way he looked when we would be together. His smile, the way he looked at me, I could feel his respect for me and his appreciation so clearly that he didn't have to verbalize it. There was just a sense when we got together and when we spoke after the series was complete, I don't know how to describe it in words. I, I'm getting a little emotional, so forgive me, but it's, um, oh, man, I could tell by the way he looked at me the way his eyes gleamed when we would get together at a premiere or walk down a red carpet or take a picture together, I knew he was happy with the job that I'd done. That I didn't screw it up. We could never duplicate what they did. We could never properly represent what they went through and what that feels like from the simplest day in boot camp, which was probably hell to the most difficult day in battle, which was hell times a million. There's no way we could ever do it justice. But I know he understood that. But I also know that what we were able to do, he was very happy with. And I know from the first time I met him to the last time that a relationship had been built and a fondness had developed and a respect was there. That made me more proud than anything. He didn't have to say anything. But knowing Lipton, this stoic leader, this deeply respected human being, who for me symbolizes American courage at its finest. You developed what you've described as more than a professional relationship. It became, in your words, one about life and children and wisdom. What did knowing Colwood Lipton teach you? Mm. Well, Carwood's appreciation for life, his grace, his respect for people. It resonates with me today. I certainly adopted uh, his credo, who needs sleep? I want to see all that life has to offer and I don't want to sleep through it all. But also his approach to leadership helps me to this day. With my band, for example, I lead much the way I imagine he led. Being able to adapt and to adjust and to listen. And I've learned there's a different way to approach each one of them, much the way that Lipton approached Malarkey, helping him get through things after he lost his friends or how he would have approached Winters or Dyke. Each person 
is unique. And each person needs to be dealt with on an individual basis. You can't just herd people around like cattle, especially strong-minded individuals who have feelings and thoughts and opinions, who have to do things that they don't always want to do. How do you get them to do that? Well, you treat each one of them with dignity and respect and truth, and you try to get them to at least be willing to take a chance. And a good leader will have people take a chance on them to motivate other people. I have to be that humble, willing to put myself out there first person that Lipton was. It's been 20 years now since Band the Brothers was released. How do you look back on the creation of the series and its enduring legacy? I know, again, we're not the real men of easy company and our lives were never in danger. There were no bullets flying past us. But, you know, those times looking across the field at a guy, he might be laying down, taking a nap on his backpack and just wake up and make eye contact with you. And just knowing that we're all in this together, it's a great feeling. It's why so many of us are still friends to this day. We didn't do what those men did. God knows we would ever have been able to do what those men did or even come close. But the blessing we had of being able to represent them bonded us, the cast and the actors, in a way that is as close as we could ever feel to being those guys. Donny Wahlberg, thank you for your generosity of time. And I'll just say it is as much of an honor for us to listen to you tell those stories as it was for you to hear Carwood Lipton's stories. Thank you and courage. Oh, thank you. Thanks for carrying on the legacy. Kurahi. Coming up next on HBO's official Band of Brothers podcast, we head to Hagenau for The Last Patrol, where the harrowing effects of the breaking point bleed through. How could anyone ever know of the price paid by soldiers in terror, agony, and bloodshed if they'd never been to places like Normandy, Bastogne, or Hagenau? And we'll be joined by Scott Grimes, the man whose portrayal of hollowed-out tech sergeant Donald Malarkey really drives home the tonnage of the combat fatigue the men were asked to carry. We'll also ask Scott about Malarkey's Luger lust. Everybody wanted a Luger was his answer. He was like, it wasn't just me, but his story is specific. I think one of those dead crabs has a Luger! A what? He was really happy that the way that was portrayed because it was almost exact. He said, I was an idiot <laughs> for doing that. That was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I'm like, I think you're good. You're here and it made for good television. Make sure to subscribe to HBO's official Band of Brothers podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate, review and share. And a reminder, as if you needed one, that you can watch The Breaking Point and every episode of Band of Brothers on HBO Max right now. Until next time. Hooray! Hooray!